Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna talk about some of the top things you need to know if you're looking to import a vehicle. A lot of the tips I'm gonna give in this video really come from just honestly mistakes I've personally made. So at one point I did own a Honda Acti. My brother has imported a R33 Skyline. Unfortunately, we don't have either of those cars anymore. Although that's really common in the import world where someone gets a car, they have it for you know six months a year, they sell it and on to the next. And um, actually since then, my brother has picked up this car right behind me. It's uh, an R32 Skyline. It's a GTST, not a GTR. I recently bought a R33 Skyline, so a lot of the things I'm about to talk about, it's actually fresh in my mind since, you know, I just went through some of it and I'm about to go through some of it since the car is supposed to be here in about two weeks. It's on a ship as I'm recording this. Anyways, on to the tips. The first thing I'd recommend is looking into your local laws. So here where I live in the United States, it's 25 years before you can import a car. Generally speaking, there's always some exceptions, but the general rule of thumb is 25 years. Other countries like Canada, it's actually 15 years. But on top of that, just be very mindful of how you plan on using the vehicle because I live in the state of Oregon. I love it here. It's actually really nice. But one of the things I hate about it is that they are very inconsistent with K vehicles. As I mentioned earlier, I owned a Honda Acti. That car was actually registered for road use and I drove it on the roads. It was my daily driver and it was super sweet. Only in town though, I would never drive that on the highway. I did once. Terrifying experience. Never again. The reason I mentioned that I used it as a daily driver is that Oregon explicitly states on their website that K vehicles vehicles can be imported to the state of Oregon, but they cannot be driven on the roads or registered for road use. More than anything, if you buy a vehicle and your plan is to drive it on the roads, just make sure it's something you can do. Because I know in my case, if the state of Oregon wanted to, they could have come through and actually revoked my registration. So at that point, I could have the vehicle, but I couldn't drive it on the roads. I don't have a farm or anything like that, so it would be useless to me. Another thing is definitely do research on whatever car you're interested in. Of course, each car is different and they tend to have different sets of problems. A good example, with the Honda Actis, they're known for actually having having timing belts that break prematurely. Again, each car is different and has their own set of problems. So just make sure you research that to figure out what's what and the biggest things to look for. I do want to note that you want to do that on top of all just regular problems. I mean, because these are old cars at this point. This Skyline's a 1990 or it's a 91. Regardless of the exact age, it's a 30 plus year old car at this point. It's going to have some issues. Another thing you want to do is research how much it's realistically going to cost and also make sure you stick to whatever budget you set. If you're trying to figure out, well, how much does this thing cost because prices can be all over the place. I say try to get as many data points as you can. So things like bring a trailer, they actually list the prices that some of these cars sold for on their website. If you go to eBay, you can actually look up whatever car you're interested in and look at the sale history on there. On top of that, if you go to a face group for whatever you're interested in, I guarantee they can help with more guidance on pricing. So like an example for me is when I was looking at the R33 that I bought, I went to a Facebook group and I asked them, hey, what do you guys think this car is reasonably worth? And of course, no one's going to be able to give me an exact determination. Ultimately, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it, but it gave me something to go by. I cannot stress enough doing your research on the price point, but also really sticking to your budget. It's going to be really easy to get enamored with a certain car and pay way more than you should. You don't want to do this. Be patient and the right car will eventually pop up. As I mentioned earlier, these cars are getting older and they're collector items at this point. At least the nice examples are. And because of that, you want to be conscientious with your insurance company. Some insurance companies are not going to be that easy to play with. This this is not like a sponsorship or anything like that, but I can tell you that for this Skyline, it's insured through Haggerty. This car's insurance policy has a agreed upon value, but also if it gets damaged in any way, shape or form, Haggerty is going to pay out and get it fixed. That's just really important because other insurance companies, they might not necessarily do that. I can just speak from personal example. When I got the Honda Acti, I had no idea about what insurance to get. So I actually went to Progressive, who I was insured through at the time for just my regular daily driver, which is a Nissan Titan. In that situation, Progressive does perfect perfectly fine. But when I tried to insure my Honda Acti with them, they said no. And I actually got denied. So I, from there, I ended up going to Geico. Going to Geico was actually just a really dumb decision. Not because Geico is bad, but because I just gave them the VIN, told them just give me basic insurance. And that's where I screwed up because had the car been in an accident or anything like that, and the other person didn't have adequate insurance, I would have been totally screwed and on the hook. Definitely learn from my mistake and do not do what I did. As I mentioned, Haggerty on this one, but there are other insurance policies or other insurance companies out there. Just do your research research, read the fine print to make sure it's going to work for what you're doing. Because one of the big things with Haggerty, at least the policy that we have here, is that the cars that are on the insurance policy cannot be daily drivers. The next thing to consider is storage, which normally isn't that big of a deal. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, my daily driver is a Nissan Titan. I don't really think twice about it because it's just a, like a utility to me, right? But since these vehicles are getting older, and as I mentioned, some of the nice ones are actually collector vehicles, they're a prime target for theft. And at least in my area, most of the thefts that happen are like just opportunities. So 
So someone goes, turns their car on, they go inside to grab something, come out, their car's gone. Well, when it comes to expensive vehicles like this, it's going to be the opposite. A lot of times they're going to be targeted. I personally know someone who had their R32 GTR stolen. They parked it outside, reported it to police, never heard about the car again, no follow-up, no nothing. The car was just gone. Luckily they had insurance, so they were able to get paid out and they were able to purchase another one. The biggest thing is if you can, store it inside. And I also put some anti-theft devices. I mean, I guess more theft deterrent, because if someone's determined enough, they're going to steal your car. But if you can slow down that process and hamper it, odds are in your favor that it's, I guess, less likely to get stolen. Once you're done doing all your research and deciding essentially where you're going to get insurance, all the common issues with the car, your budget, all that good stuff, etc. Your next step is really going to an importer to get your car. In a lot of cases, they have stock in Japan that you can choose from. Sometimes they have some that's already stateside. Typically, if you're buying stock that's from Japan, you're going to get a bit of a discount because you're taking a gamble on it versus something that's already stateside where you can physically see it. The biggest thing here though is just trying not to get ripped off. Unfortunately, there's a lot of scummy people in the import business. And if you get a car, like let's just say you get something that's advertised as this pristine car, you get it and it's a piece of junk. Oftentimes you don't have much recourse. In a lot of cases, you're going to end up having to take someone to court if you get screwed over. So if you can always inspect the vehicle in person so you can see all the little things. A lot of cases they'll provide you with like photos. Actually, here are some photos on the screen of my brother when he got his R33 Skyline. The photos actually make the car look pretty good, but then when we ended up getting it, we noticed that there is actually body damage that had been poorly repaired on the rear passenger side. We later discovered that that was actually rust and it had just been bondoed over. And honestly, it's kind of hard to say who's at fault because the importer we worked with, you know, they're giving us all the information they have. So on top of pictures, we typically get some other documentation like um, the auction sheet, assuming it came from an auction and stuff like that. But even those things, it's not out of the question for someone to lie on the auction sheet to make the car go for more. It's just really one of the unfortunate things when it comes to the import business. If you're ever in a situation where you're unsure about the car, if something just seems off, honestly, walk away because there's going to be other vehicles you can buy. A useful thing that I'll do is there's a group called I Got Screwed by a Shady JDM Importer. And essentially people go on there and they talk about their bad experiences and also good experiences with importers. So I'll link to that down below because that way the community helps hold bad importers accountable. Let's say you've already bought in your car and you're actually going to take possession of it. Something to, to be considerate of is that it's possible some things are missing and generally those types of things are, well, just things that easily come off a car, like a shift knob. As I mentioned earlier, you get pictures typically when you buy a car. Let's say you get it and the shift knob's missing. Well, it kind of out of luck on that one because between like it being sold from, typically you get the cars from, uh, from auctions in Japan, right? From it going from the auction house to the shipping yard in Japan, to being on a ship, to the shipping yard stateside. And then from there, it typically can go either directly to you or in other cases, it will go directly to the importer and then you take possession of it. But what I'm trying to illustrate though, is that there's a lot of hands in the pot and it's easy for little things like that to walk away. Another thing is something I've already touched on and that's the fact that there's going to be unexpected damage. I just want to know, these are old cars. So it's going to be normal to have, you know, scrapes, dings, things of that nature. Maybe the interior is showing its age a little bit, but to have body damage that's not reported or find like large amounts of rust, that's not normal. If anything, do your best to go through a reputable dealer. And yeah, you're probably going to pay more, but you know, you're getting a good car because one of the biggest things I've learned is that a cheap project car tends to be more expensive than a expensive example of a car. And the Skyline behind me is a good example. So my brother bought this at the cheaper end. It was advertised as a project. And so, you know, essentially he was told, Hey, there's some issues here. It's going to need some TLC. Like you can even notice some weird stuff. So like right here, you're going to notice the hood doesn't line up well. And for whatever reason, even though this car is a GTST, it has a GTR hood, but the rest of the body is still the GTST panels. By the time I know we're done with this car, we could have easily just bought in like a really nice example instead of buying a project. But there's the other side to it that we like working on cars. It's fun. It's a good hobby. So in our case, it's not a big deal. But if you're not mechanically inclined, you don't want to take on a project. Honestly, look for a nicer example and work with a reputable importer. Even if you get the nicest example of a vehicle, you're going to want to do maintenance. I mean, sure, sometimes you might get like service history, which is honestly really rare. You normally don't get that type of stuff. Be very skeptical of it because those things are easily forged. And again, I, I try not to be negative, but the reality of the situation is there are some scummy people in this industry who just want to make a buck and they'll, they'll lie to make an extra dollar. Put some money aside to do maintenance. If you're mechanically inclined, you may not have to put as much. And if you're not mechanically inclined, you know, I'd probably put a little bit more aside because like, let's just say you need to do a timing belt job on this skyline. If I go to a shop to do it, well, first of all, I need to find a shop that's willing to. In my area, there's not actually any. I would have to travel about an hour north to Portland. And 
and I know I'm going to look at at least a thousand dollars between parts and labor. So it can get significantly more expensive if you're paying a mechanic to do the work. And on the note of parts, you're going to want to be conscientious of the maintenance schedule because getting parts, it's not like you can just go down to your local like auto zone. When my brother first bought the car, he did order a timing belt kit for this car and that ended up taking about two weeks to arrive, which is actually pretty good because sometimes parts can take even longer. Definitely just do your best to think ahead and have like a set schedule so you're not sidelined because of some tiny little thing. Overall, there are a lot of things to consider if you're looking at buying a imported vehicle from, you know, where you're going to store it, insurance, can you even import it to your country, uh, your state, your county, wherever you're at, how are you going to maintain the thing? You're doing the work yourself, are you not? Working with a reputable importer, you can import it yourself. That's actually what I'm doing with my R33 Skyline. Um, I just didn't really want to touch on that video because that's a whole rabbit hole in itself, but there's so many variables. So do your best to be prepared and just know it's actually worth it and it's a lot of fun. Literally just yesterday, my brother and I went on a cruise. So he was in his R32 Skyline and I was in my MR2 here, which is actually pretty cool because this thing has a supercharged V6 in it. So they're both very cool and unique cars. Anyways, it was just really cool cruising together down the road. We were actually at a stoplight and a few people came running out of a store to take pictures of the car. Unfortunately, they didn't care about my car. It was all about the Skyline right here. And it's just one of those big things like we're making memories with the cars. And I think a lot of people who get into this type of stuff, it's the same thing. You're looking to make cool memories. When it comes to buying cars like this, it's really the old idea that adults don't really grow up. They're still children at heart. They just have a little bit of money to uh, burn through. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. If you have any questions at all, leave them down in the comment section down below. I do acknowledge I'm not an expert, but I will do my best to answer them. Or if not, I'll give you guys direction where you can go look for the answer. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys in another video.